Thank you. Um, so it's Resilience to Nature's Challenge is the name of our, of our challenge. It's one of 11 challenges. And you've had this interesting talk about resilience. And you've seen resilience is all about looking for uncertainty and, and, uh, and trying to understand the ways in which you could respond to all kinds of uncertainty. So I'm going to tell you one uh, version of one person's perspective of resilience, um, which would be if we're really good at everything, we don't need emergency managers. And you know that's complete bullshit because... <laughs> Basically, when it comes to resilience, it's all of our systems and it's all of our activities, not just emergency management, but including emergency management, all of the aspects in and around the way in which we live our lives. And when I say we have to be resilient to nat nature's challenges, it's also quite difficult to focus our attention just on natural hazard, and you, you're all struggling with this in, in various parts of your uh, whole working life, that there are all kinds of challenges, not just nature's challenges, and not just natural hazards. And so we're going to bear that in mind as we go through. The idea is we've got a 10-year remit to develop an increased level of resilience in New Zealand. We don't quite know how we could measure that. We don't quite know what that's going to look like, but we're going to take a very positive step forward and series of steps forward to try and build a, a stronger, more resilient New Zealand. So there are a number of research partners, there are a number of partnerships out in the community, out in the uh, environment and associated with all kinds of districts and regions in New Zealand. I'm going to give you a snapshot of some of the activity that's taking place. Uh, we've just contracted most of the research program and away we'll be going with a structure that looks a, look like, a lot like this. So we have a series of uh, four major co-creation laboratories where we are trying to bring the resilient solutions into the community. So these are our main uh, wheels of focus, if you like, where we're bringing all of this technical information and associated technical information, not only from within the resilience challenge, but also knowledge generated elsewhere, and bringing it into these areas where we think our first priorities are to test out some new ways of doing things, some new ways of building that adaptability and that resilience. Another way of looking at it is we're trying to wrap our, our, our resilient community up into a series of supporting structures, some interesting new science and new ways of doing science, uh, joining the scientists with the end users, if you like, or trying to co-create not only the questions that we need to uh, answer, but also some of the solutions. And then surrounding this with, with our specific technical knowledge that we're putting new investment into. And then also recognising there's a lot more technical knowledge in and around that that's coming from all kinds of other uh, initiatives, including things such as the Natural Hazards Research Platform, the um, GeoNet, the Earthquake Commission Research, all kinds of other research that's going on. We're not replacing this, but what we're trying to do is build on to this. We've got our four priority laboratories and these uh, wonderful people here are leading them. Um, we've got a focus on, on rural uh, issues and rural resilience and specific solutions needed there. Uh, we've also got a focus on some urban issues and in this particular case we're focusing our attention on uh, the Auckland city and also trying to build networks between our cities to develop really interesting new New Zealand based resilience practices. Uh, the edge living on the edge, living in our coastal communities, living with the uh, prospect of climate change and living sea level change and all kinds of thorny political issues in and around uh, retreat and in and around how we do things around land use planning and so on. Mataranga Māori and the whole issues around how we would develop uh, new knowledge to, to look at the Māori community, the Māori economy, the emerging Māori businesses. Just a snapshot into the urban resilience profile, this is a huge suite of projects that are involving many more partners that are being just directly funded by our challenge. We're looking at aspects of the Resilient Cities Network, so the network of, 
of knowledge that's being generated and also in Wellington and Christchurch from the Resilient Cities program, but also our other urban areas where there are things that are working well. Looking at aspects of the diverse communities, communities of place, communities of culture, communities of belief. Looking at the way in which we need to understand and draw in the business aspects of resilience and also the aspects of infrastructure that all of the things that make our communities function, the lifelines that under, underpin our activities. And then also thinking about the planning, the future. Uh, what are we doing uh, in terms of replacement of assets? What are we doing in terms of thinking about what our infrastructure and what our communities should, like in should look like in future? In the rural laboratory, there's a whole lot of focus around uh, existing structures in place, so the, the whole rural support networks, the, the way in which rural communities band together, trying to build on our, our kind of strength and natural resilience within that, within that rural environment. And so this includes three key projects. One of them is around supply chain management um, and the whole rural supply chain. And another one is around our resilience to wildfire. And so we've got some key players involved in that from Scion. Living on the Edge, this is one of the programs where we thought was going to be the most difficult and most risky. So this is where we really want to get out there on the edge and come up with some problems that we may not solve. Try to get into some issues that are really difficult for us to focus on as a nation because we're all focused on our existing uh, rules, our existing legislation. And this is about trying to look at the issue of whether or not people in locations such as this need to retreat from the coast. And this is a reality in some parts of New Zealand today, but it will be a reality in many parts of New Zealand as we, as we move on over the next decade or two decades or so. So trying to focus on can we come up with solutions in a different way? Can we build a shared science community, government understanding of an issue and bring that through into something that will work within our legislative context? And if we can't, what can we do about changing the way we do things? The Māori Resilience Lab, this is focusing on all kinds of aspects of not only uh, Mataranga Māori, not, not only um, coming up with, with uh, our traditional, uh, I guess, res response and use of Māori assets within times of crisis, crisis, but also looking at the whole emergent Māori economy and the Māori business and looking at ways that we can, we can grow and develop um, slightly different and maybe quite interesting ways of approaching resilience from this perspective. Underpinning a lot of this, we're trying to bring in some, some key people from all kinds of different areas that are bringing us scholarship to, to support the, the, the approaches we're taking at that community level. So support around governance, to support, support around decision making, support around engineering and the way in which um, our networks that support our communities function, support around economics. A little taster of this, and I was hoping that Gary McDonald was going to be here so I could take the mickey out of him, him, him being me, uh, in the middle of this, and he thinks economics is, a question, is the answer for a lot of things, and it certainly is. Economics is, is the central portion of a lot of the programs that we've got running, and a lot of it is about you know, building and motivating incentives, uh, looking for the incentives for resilient behaviours and changes, uh, looking for... Um, ways in which uh, resilient strategies can be funded and adopted. And then John Vargo, who is here, is smiling up at us at the top of that picture. Um, he's looking at ways in which we could actually understand how we would measure resilience. How do we even know how resilient we are now? How would we even know how resilient we might be in five to ten years' time? And, and how could we even develop targets for resilience when, when it's such a vague and varied concept? And this is uh, a big project idea around how do we develop it. And then we've got um, a complicated diagram drawn by a mathematician who's in the top left corner, there, top right corner there. And um, Mark Bevington uh, is trying to look at ways 
not of creating new hazard information, but how do we bring together all this hazard information from various different sources, and how do we bring it together, not only in a mathematical context, but in a scenario context, and how do we bring it and make it relevant in a community context? And so if you haven't seen us already, we'll be coming to a town near you soon. These are the main case study sites that we're going to be focusing on, and you'll be seeing and hearing a lot from us over the next 10 years. Thank you, Shane. Stuck miraculously to time, which I'm quite impressed with. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Professor Ken Alwood to the stage. He is director of Quake Core, and hopefully your idea of resilience is not to put all of us emergency managers out of <laughs> No, we fully support emergency managers at Quake Core. Uh, no, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here um, to, to talk about Quake Core. And I think it's, it's uh, appropriate that I follow on from Shane and the National Science Challenge, because as the National Science Challenge, as you've seen, is quite broad, covering across um, many different disciplines, many different uh, hazards. Uh, quake Core then provides depth uh, on, the, on the earthquake hazard, and then provides some focus related to the built environment. Um, and uh, as a core, a center of research excellence, we're one of 10 centers of research excellence across the country. Um, we bring a whole lot of depth and, and research to support building an earthquake resilient New Zealand. Um, and so, but I'm, I'm just here as, as a representative of a, of a great team, um, and uh, I can't take uh, all the credit, neither all the blame for this uh, full program. Really, it's, it's, a, it's a team of, of diverse members um, from, uh, from many of our uh, six different, uh, seven different partners. Uh, across the country. Uh, I want to particularly note my uh, deputy director, uh, Brendan Bradley, at the University of Canterbury. Um, so what is Quake Core? Well, Quake Core, uh, just like every other entity, needs a mission, and, and we're, we, we're there for transforming the earthquake resilience of communities and societies. But how do we achieve that? We achieve that through, well, of course, research, uh, innovative world-class research as a center of research excellence, of course, research is at our core. Uh, of course, education uh, being funded by the Tertiary Education Commission. Education is fundamental to what we uh, do and, and provide. Uh, but very importantly, it is the deep uh, collaborations that we're, we're, that we're developing, both here uh, domestically in New, New Zealand amongst the uh, very uh, complex ecosystem uh, that uh, works in the earthquake resilience space, which I'll talk about in a moment, but also internationally. Uh, there's a great wealth of, of uh, research development internationally that we can leverage, uh, and uh, I think we have great opportunity as a center of research excellence to do that. Uh, let me just talk a bit about the primary structure of, of Quake Core. Uh, we're built upon uh, two primary uh, pieces, our technology platforms and our flagship programs. Our technology platforms is essentially underpinning infrastructure that supports all of the research that we do. So uh, in engineering, of course, we like to uh, build things uh, and break things as large scale uh, in large scale laboratories. And we've learned through uh, events like Christchurch that we need to build at a bi bigger scale, test at a bigger scale to truly understand how our infrastructure performs in uh, severe events like, like Christchurch. And so we're coming on board at a great time with the uh, building and, and um, recent opening of a brand new facilities, both at the University of Auckland and the University of Canterbury for uh, structural testing. But the first picture I show there is actually the world's largest shake table in Japan. And I show that to, to emphasize that uh, the, the core really brings us more than just the facilities here in New Zealand. The idea is to integrate with our partners internationally to provide access to these very unique facilities overseas. We've already started to do that with some agreements uh, with uh, very um, new facilities in China. Well, moving on in the interest of time, uh, we've also uh, got a technology platform on field testing and monitoring where we're starting to work very closely with GeoNet. Um, 
Whoops, sorry. Uh, also, uh, the, another technology platform on multidisciplinary and community data sets. Here, we're looking to facilitate access to these uh, wealth of data sets that are out there, not necessarily to host, but to provide, to, to facilitate the access for researchers so that they can make use of the wealth of information as available, both from a post-event data after, say, Christchurch or the Cook Strait earthquakes, but also uh, pre-event information like inventories and so on. And we heard some great talks this morning about uh, data through LINs, so working closely with them. And then uh, simulation and data visualization is our final one, where we really are working to facilitate the interaction of various different simulation tools so you can get full system level uh, simulations that are so important for making decisions, uh, policy decisions based on our best science of what is actually going to happen. And the science, the research happens within these flagship programs. And I'll walk through uh, very briefly what each one of these programs does. Uh, but first, let me show where Quake Core fits within a complex ecosystem of uh, that, that makes up the, the funding environment in, in New Zealand. And um, this is a uh, figure that was initially put together by um, Richard Smith at EQC, just showing that there's a wealth of, of, um, of opportunity, actually, here in New Zealand in research in the built environment and, um, and uh, earthquake resilience. And of course, I can move these bubbles around to make a space for where Quake Core is going to go. Uh, but I, I do see, while this is a complex environment um, and may pose some challenges, I actually see the opportunities, opportunities of linking up everything that's happening across these different, uh, um, in these different bubbles. And I think that's already starting to happen. So very quickly, let me just run through some of these flagship um, activities. There's ground motion simulation and validation. Here, we're moving away from simply empirical understanding of, of what the ground motion shaking, or what the ground shaking may be at a particular site to physics-based models that tell us better what's happening uh, at any site, regardless of our experience from past earthquakes at, at that site. Um, and as well, being able to use that information to help with policy because we can develop uh, useful scenarios. Um, then liquefaction impacts on, on infrastructure. Here we're moving away from just simply saying liquefaction will happen to saying what are the impacts of that liquefaction on our infrastructure. And here just showing the example of a bridge, but it could be a, a building or houses, and what sort of mitigation strategies are available to address those impacts. Earthquake prone buildings, of course, this is a huge issue for New Zealand that we're all struggling with now. Um, and at Quake Core, what we want to do is approach it from a multidisciplinary lens. So we have aspects of both the structural response of those buildings, the economics of actually addressing those buildings, and of course, the people in policy that, that, that are actually impacted by those buildings. Um, and so bringing all those together, try to find optimal solutions. Then uh, moving on to sort of a next generation of infrastructure beyond those, or, uh, to replace those earthquake prone buildings, you might say, looking towards trying to uh, encourage low damage and repairable solutions such that we try to avoid situations like this in the future of the widespread demolitions that we're seeing across Christchurch CBD. Then, uh, we move to a more social science end of the spectrum where we grapple with uh, how best do we invest to improve New Zealand's resilience to earthquakes. And uh, there are lots of tough decisions to achieve that uh, resilience and, and uh, lots of balancing that we need to do. So how do we uh, best invest our limited resources, not just dollars, but of course, people time uh, to achieve that resilience. All kinds of questions we could be targeting where best to put in our efforts. And then finally, a spatially distributed infrastructure where we're trying to quantify the resilience of our distributed infrastructure and 
what are the benefits for uh, taking mitigation measures for that infrastructure. And this is a very important flagship because this links directly with the science challenge. In fact, this uh, flagship serves as uh, the infrastructural toolbox within the science challenge so that the, all that you've heard just now about the science challenge is directly linked with Quake Core and we can leverage each, each other's efforts um, and directions. So I'd just like to end with a reflection on how what we're doing within Quake Core contributes to the Sendai framework. And we haven't heard too much about the Sendai framework here today, but I think many of you are, are probably quite familiar with it. So, but these are just the uh, seven targets that were arrived at and, and uh, specified in that framework. And I see that each one of our flagships really addresses one of those of those targets. And um, by identifying how we as, as researchers, as research programs, link uh, and, and address those uh, targets, and if we do that sort of across the board and the different efforts across government, I think we can start to see how all of that, those efforts can connect in to improve uh, disaster, disaster risk management. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Next, I'd like to welcome Catherine Delaire from Opus Consulting, who is going to talk to us today on resilience-informed asset management. Hello, everyone. I come to you from North Vancouver, British Columbia. I come to you from Canada. I am an asset management engineer. I've got 15 years in the Naval Reserves as well, and I think that's where I've got my, uh, my resilience thinking from, through all those exercises I've done over time. And I come to you from a country that's um, fighting some pretty massive wildfires right now. I was in Fort McMurray last January, and so glad to see that everyone survived that evacuation of 80,000 people from that community. Um, we're faced with mostly natural disasters in Canada. Um, and there's been quite a few hits um, to the province of Alberta actually recently. Right now there's the forest fires in Fort McMurray, but in 2013 there was the Alberta floods um, that impacted about 20 or so municipalities. Um, and there's some good case studies to be drawn from that event that can relate resilience and asset management. And there's the case of the city of Calgary. The city of Calgary, um, once the floodwaters had receded, was able to recover really fast from the flood. Uh, Steve Witten, their main asset management engineer, had the capacity to go out there with his team and get really good information to give, within 72 hours, a good debrief of what the impacts of the assets were, what the general costs would be, and I think the reason why uh, Steve said it himself, why he was able to achieve that, is that he had good working knowledge of the infrastructure, of the assets. There's other cases um, that were uh, other municipalities that didn't do so well. Uh, the recovery was much more challenging because they didn't have that working knowledge of their infrastructure. They didn't have a, st a structure to define what was critical, what wasn't. So they were left scrambling. And what I want to show to you is the touch points between asset management and resilience. Now, within asset management, there's an inherent drive towards business co continuity. It, goes at the inception of the asset and its design. A lot of redundancies are built into certainly water systems, which is my background, but other systems as well. Um, there's a drive in, in that's uh, related also to those inventories. It's having a good understanding of everything that you own and its value, what it does. Uh, but you see it when you speak with operators, maintainers. They are always uh, striving to reduce risks, reduce uh, any disruptions to service. Um, that's their life's work, and um, they take a lot of pride into it. And beyond that level, there's even people in the office that'll do that conditioning monitoring, condition, um, that de deterioration modeling. They also uh, look at business continuity. They have that focus. And that comes from a really desire to serve the community. Um, it relates to those levels of service that we're striving to offer to the community, and it goes into that long-term vision as well. We're looking at, in the field of asset management, what is the sustainable level of service right now, but for generations to come? What are the investments that need to be done now um, that will impact the long run? But that sounds all fine and well, 
but really um, when you scratch the surface, there's, there are some things lagging within the asset management sphere that I wanna expose to you because I think you can contribute a lot within this space of emergency preparedness. But before I can explain how resilience can inform asset management, I thought I'd tell you a bit about who currently dominates that, that realm um, and what are their drivers. Now, it's mostly made up of engineers like myself. And engineers, at their best um, and at their worst, they're linear thinkers. Um, it's within our professional duty to protect public health and protect the environment. And asset management has allowed us to really rationalize budgets and prioritize works um, because we're faced with a really large asset portfolio but constrained funding. So we've been able to optimize and really bring in risk thinking into how we select investments uh, into repairs but also new, uh, new investments, new capital. And again, that comes with that drive to service the community. But um, there's more to what the community needs than just infrastructure. Um, what I want to share here, and this is where I think there's going to be that interface between asset management and resilience, is that when it comes to our communities um, and the communities we serve, they're not just about the infrastructure that underlies them. There are many knock-on effects to the infrastructure that are actually not very well understood by engineers. Um, and yet, these knock-on effects um, have an immense influence on the resilience of our community and they actually get truly tested in the face of a disaster. I mean, the built environment influences our activities, our lifestyles, our, our community, really, all of it, our economy. Um, and if we're to become resilient to a changing climate, a changing economy, uh, shifting demographics, um, even the shock of earthquakes, I think we'll need to better understand the impact of the built environment so we can manage it at that much, so we can manage it that much better um, facing capital constraints, uh, but also facing um, large, large risks facing disaster. An example that I have of this, and I know the following speaker I think will be able to touch on this um, really well, is for example, when um, in the past when I've done network criticality assessments, um, there's a large focus on, on lifelines, but you have to dig a bit deeper. And when we've done water modeling in Canada, um, we've often looked at the CBD and we've prioritized you know, the criticality of assets based on that. But then if you're a bit creative, then you start thinking about the hospital, the old age home, the schools, all of these other layers that will be lost on engineers with that linear thinking possibly. And it's that creativity that I think would be would bring a lot of value within that asset management space that I see and I've heard in the conversations here. Um, so I'll have a demonstration a bit of what that asset management model looks like so you can see where you can probably interface with people that are doing asset management within your organization. Because the example that came to my mind was, you know, if, if there is a disaster, would you because uh, when we do those models, we'll put all of the commercial sector at the same level. We won't differentiate just for simplicity. But really, would you reinstate service to a dentist before a cafe? Possibly not. Like, there's not that same value that you get from the cafe following a large disaster because it's a hub. It's where people gather. Um, it really helps with social cohesion uh, following a large event. Food for thought for you guys. <clears throat> but what asset management brought, just as a heads up, is that it did bring two professions together that weren't speaking before. It brought the engineers and the accountants together. It's a huge breakthrough, and it kind of led to something that we called accountaneering in Canada. But finally, they were speaking the same language, working towards similar goals, um, working together. And it's not to say that people involved in the emergency preparedness space can't also engage um, and bring in that kind of understanding of community and community risks within that asset management space. Uh, again, because there is that um, element of creativity here and understanding of community that I think is unique. So questions that are asked in asset management to set priorities are a bit of what you've got there. I've put an asterisk on those where I think there could be some uh, good uh, touch points. Uh, for example, what do we have? We have an inventory, we have assets, but there's more to the community than those assets. Um, and that's where that understanding that you have comes into play. What is it worth? It's not just about its 
uh, dollar value, but also its impact to the community, um, relevance to community well-being, welfare. And then that's where you can have that discussion about what you want those assets to do, especially um, with all of the risks um, that you know you're facing as an organization. So this is a framework that's published by the Institute of Asset Management that shows a bit of the dynamic of asset management. There'll be variances to this from um, organization to organization, but it's a good starting point for, for you. Um, so you'll see that there's at the top the customers, legislation, people that are investing in the community um, are there and they're interfacing at that strategic plan level. And then below that, there's kind of that dynamic system of asset management. And the touch points that I see are certainly in that organizational and people realm where you can come in and contribute, contribute your ideas and thinking when it comes to strategy planning, but also the risks and review. Um, I have mentioned to you that you know, asset management is focused on business continuity. We build it into maintenance programs. Uh, we try to build in structure into organizations so that they're not vulnerable to even retirements. Uh, but there are some things within that space that's, that we're wanting to scratch the surface on. Um, I'm here to do research on that this week. Um, but I also welcome you to explore that space within your organizations. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. We're doing pretty well for time, so those questions might actually get answered. Um, perfect follow-on from Catherine's talk. We ha we're going to be looking at built envir environment resilience with the Chief Engineer for the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Environment, Mike Stannard. Thanks, Sarah, and um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as a simple engineer, maybe not demonstrating linear thinking, I hope, <laughs> uh, it is my contention that to increase the, build, the uh, resilience of our building stock, we firstly need to understand better uh, building performance in New Zealand's hazardous environment, but we also need to be able to use that knowledge uh, and build according to that knowledge. If we just built knowing what we already know, uh, we would already have, we would have far few fa failures than we, than we experience nowadays. Uh, and to this end, uh, MB is one strongly supporting the research effort uh, to better understand building performance. Uh, it's also uh, got an extensive work program uh, for setting minimum standards within the Building Act and the Building Code. And thirdly, there are initiatives uh, to encourage better decision making by owners uh, to build for resilience. Uh, often that may be beyond regulatory minimum. So today I'll briefly discuss the MB Resilience Work Program, uh, output from the Built Environment Leaders Forum, uh, which is encouraging better decision making, and finally list some future resilience challenges. So the work program. Um, there's certainly multiple drivers to ensure we learn from the Canterbury experience, whether it is just for those who have lost loved ones uh, or for the social disruption caused to the people of Canterbury, uh, or when considering New Zealand's future economic situation uh, going into the future. Now, the Royal Commission uh, recommendations have provided a very important direction for MB. And uh, Canterbury obviously was, uh, had a, um, uh, one of the unique features around the Canterbury earthquakes was the, um, the land damage that was caused. And so we have an extensive geotechnical uh, program, um, planning and building guidance for areas subject to liquefaction around the country. There's a national geotechnical database that's now been established, building on the Canterbury Geotech database, which was very, very important for the um, for the Canterbury rebuild, and actually uh, the geographic constraints are being removed so that you can enter data in from anywhere in the country um, from tomorrow. So that's a small announcement. Um, and we've also uh, jointly with the New Zealand Geotechnical Society uh, doing a number of uh, guidance modules for for practicing engineers 
um, on investigations, on liquefaction assessment, foundation and retaining wall, uh, design, ground improvement methods and specifications, uh, slope stability and rockfall protection structures. So there's a big program of work. A number of those um, um, projects guidance has already been developed and this progressively can be rolled out for the rest of the rest of this year. Uh, there's a number of structural engineering projects um, underway too, learning from the Canterbury experience. Uh, there's a review of the structural provisions in the building code and structural design standards, so there'll be consultation coming out hopefully this year on some of the uh, settings that we, you know, we establish in the building code. Um, there's a review going on of the design and construction of non-structural building elements, you know, ceilings and um, building services and the like, which have caused considerable damage. Um, assessing and improving seismic performance of buildings, and we'll touch about touch that on, on in that in a moment with the earthquake prone buildings, uh, and certainly encouraging low damage design technologies, robust uh, technologies, that's the like, such as the base isolation um, um, systems that was, were developed in New Zealand. And finally, we're looking at a review of our national seismic hazard model. So um, you'll be aware that the building, earthquake prone buildings amendment act was enacted last week uh, and the revised provisions will come into effect sometime next year. Um, and in brief, um, you know, this is addressing, it's, it's been a complex piece of legislation and public policy making uh, because it addresses all the earthquake risk buildings around the country. Um, and there's there been quite a few changes over the last two, three years in the, in the policy development. Uh, there is a variable timetable now for strengthening buildings relative to the earthquake risk, so there is a different framework for Northland compared to Wellington, for example. Uh, it prioritises education and emergency buildings for strengthening. It reduces the number of buildings requiring assessment. Um, quite a number have been taken out of the, out of the um, picture. Uh, introduces new measures to encourage update upgrades earlier. Um, and picture there of the public trust building in Wellington, which you know, we all know was strengthened after the Seddon earthquake, because that's what it's all about. It's trying to get improvement to our built environment. We've got um, a big project around emergency management of, build, uh, of better management of buildings in an emergency, and that's where we hope we can uh, find better ways of engaging with you as emergency managers. Um, we have new functions and uh, responsibilities uh, for the building management following emergency. Uh, we've been prepared, this guidance been prepared. Uh, there's been quite a number of training uh, sessions being held, and we have now got a, a good framework for forensic investigations uh, for buildings when there is failure. Um, research you've already heard about from, from, from Ken, so I'll flick over that quickly, but just to say we are working very closely and there are some great international collaboration opportunities uh, going forward. Um, the Built Environment Leaders Forum, uh, this was a, um, held in uh, September last year, five years on from the, from the Darfield uh, event, to encourage better decision making for resilience. And we, along with EQC and Brands, jointly hosted uh, this um, you know, very useful um, initiative. And I would like to acknowledge the uh, work of Pam Johnson and a whole team of others who have contributed to this initiative. Um, it was to reflect on the built environment lessons from Canterbury. It was about public and private sector um, discussing uh, natural hazard risk reduction, uh, five key themes, uh, and the aim was to develop an action plan to achieve a more resilient built environment. 
and the action plan has been developed. I know you're all poised and waiting for it. Um, it is just going through its final approval stages for release. Uh, there has been follow-up meetings in December and the steering committee has been meeting on a number of occasions uh, and strong support for continuing engagement and discussion. And in other words, it's not just a one-off event. Uh, the mechanisms for doing this are still being worked through. And I'll quickly outline some of the proposed action plan. Um, a framework was developed. This was the result of the, the discussions at the... Um, so uh, having a national level uh, governance and framework for managing risks to the built environment, appropriate decision-making frameworks, uh, incentive and, and tools to support appropriate levels of private and public sector investment in urban resilience, uh, better public understanding of the risks from natural hazards, and to educate communities on the consequences of not investing in resilience, and information and evidence under the bottom there to sell the resilience story and support the development of prudent risk mitigation measures. Now, there's a whole lot of priorities for action, but I see I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna have to quickly uh, run through those, if you can read them quickly. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Governance and leadership, you can achieve to um, see some of the priority areas. So there was a whole host of them. They've been refined down. Um, and certainly some of the recommendations is to achieve a stronger collaboration, and we've talked about that quite a lot already today, between public and private sectors. Um, ensure our critical infrastructure is protected and recognise the importance of lifeline utilities and lifeline groups. Uh, Decision-making framework better understand built environment decision making frameworks, improve consistency in the built environment uh, regulation and guidance, and support central and local government capability to make good decisions. Um, incentives and tools, assess if we have the right instruments to increase resilience, give communities a framework to make decisions on the resilience of their buildings. Public engagement and communications, provide building owners and occupants with a better understanding of hazards and resilience, improve community involvement in built environment hazards and risk management, and engage the public on levels of service expectation and infrastructure. And the final area was information, data and evidence. Develop evidence to improve built environment resilience across all of the above priority areas for action. Identify built environment strengthening measures that deliver the best benefit cost resilience gains, and examine systems approach, approaches to better understand interdependencies uh, within and among infrastructure systems. So finally, built of future challenges, um, adapting our buildings and infrastructure to climate change, adapting to technologi technological change, preparing our built environment for the real rare events, uh, selling the concept of resilience and paying that little bit extra if needed, and connected system thinking. And I think, again, we've heard quite a bit of that, uh, and the regulatory systems for building land and, and infrastructure so that we actually think of our buildings within urban precincts and understand and manage the interconnections of component parts particularly our built, and built structures and their site conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Next up we have Mark Kinvig from Wellington Water who will be talking to us about water. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah, and thank you for the um, thank you for the invite um, to talk this afternoon. Um, just um, a quick a quick introduction on on Wellington Water for those of you who may not be familiar with with us. Um, we're a, we're a council controlled um, organisation. Um, our client councils um, uh, we've got five um, five clients: the Greater Wellington Regional Council, um, Hutt, Hutt Council, Upper Hutt, Potterua, and Wellington City Council. So we, um, we act as a, what we call a, a trusted advisor to those, to those five councils across the three waters. 
Um, and our, our value proposition um, in this region uh, as Wellington Water is, is basically that we're in a really strong position to be able to take um, a regional approach. And that's exactly what we've um, been able to do on, um, you know, on, the, on the regional water supply. Um, when the, um, the, the two organizations, the bulk water organization and the, and the four cities um, came together to, to, to create Wellington Water, um, for the first time we were able to um, consider the whole value chain from, you know, from the catchment all the way through all the reservoirs to the customer's tap. So in terms of this work, um, you, know, you know, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite, quite, quite unique in, in for, for us in this region in that we're able to take that, that holistic view. So two years ago, um, our client councils decided, um, our political leaders decided that, um, you know, it was time we, we, we took a look at the water supply resilience. Um, it's one of four uh, regional initiatives, um, so it's something that we've been focusing on for the last, for the last two years. Um, one thing um, I have learned is that you need to be resilient to do resilient stuff. Um, just, just looking at the um, state of our project director over there, you know, he's, he's only halfway through and he's already looking worn out. So I think, I think it's, import it's important to kind of stick with it. And, um, y you know, it, it does take a lot of effort because you have to work with almost everybody to make, to make, it, to make it work. So basically, this, this, um, this short presentation um, describes the what, the why, and the how, and, and how our thinking is, it is evolving in terms of water supply resilience. Um, just um, reflecting on, um, on Norm's um, um, presentation, you know, just before a afternoon um, tea, um, and Catherine's as well, in terms, this, this is at, at the heart of our um, asset management um, approach that we're developing in Wellington Water. Um, and basically the idea is that we've got these um, three, three outcomes, safe and healthy water, respectful of the environment, uh, resilient networks, um, support the economy, and we've got 12 um, service goals. And if you look at those service goals, they basically um, define um, you know, the services that we provide um, for, for the community across all three waters from an outcome perspective. Um, this, is, this is very, very powerful because if we can understand um, the performance um, of, of, of our service against each of these goals, and we can then have a conversation with our communities about where they actually want to be, then we can then understand the gap and then understand what the investment need is and the solutions that get us from where we are today to where we want to be. So that's exactly what we're doing in terms of resilience. And as you can see, um, you know, that, that goal there um, t it really kind of um, ties in um, nicely with the, with the work that we're doing. So there's been a, there's been a lot of um, good work on readiness and, and, and thinking about, you know, wh um, what, would, what would happen post-event. But um, our work is about um, risk, is about risk reduction. Um, we, we started working on the, on the water supply and um, resilience work almost a year ago now. Um, and we we're progressing through, um, we're following the uh, Treasury's Better Business Case approach. Uh, and we're um, halfway through the program business case at the moment. And we expect to be um, complete around, um, around December this year. Um, and then we've just kicked off the, um, the wastewater um, business case as, as well. In terms of um, stormwater, that's a, you know, that's a separate piece of work that we'll be, that we'll be following through. We can't, we can't do everything all at once. It kind of blows your mind when you try and think of all the things that could go wrong. Um, just a simple, um, a simple view of our uh, water system in the, in, the, um, in the Wellington region here. We've got, um, we've got three water sources. Um, uh, when I've um, been doing this presentation over the last couple of months, you know, to, to our client councils, um, a, lo a lot of questions around um, what have we learned from Christchurch? Well, we do know that we are very different to Christchurch. You know, there are 50, uh, I think there are over 50 uh, water uh, access points across the, um, the Christchurch plains and a, and a roading network that allows you to get to those um, from almost every direction. In Wellington, we've got two um, state highways, as, as you know, that feed into the, into the city. And, and we've only got three um, water sources, and the distance between those water sources and where it's required at the tap are significant. Um, so th that's, that we're in a, quite a unique position and quite a vulnerable um, um, position. About 180 kilometers of bulk water network, uh, multiple reservoirs um, spread across the region, and a reticulation network that's made up of uh, multiple materials. Um, some of them are over 100 years old. Um, and around 40 to 50 percent of them would be classed as um, brittle materials. So when you look at that system, uh, and you consider the distance between those water sources and, and you know where 
where, where we are um, as customers, um, then you know we, we are vulnerable, and it does need you know it does need some careful um, thinking. So what what is this what is this all about? Um, it's it's basically uh, you know it's about the economy, and that's that's what our focus is is on. Um, as I said before, you know, there's a lot of a lot of good work gone on in the past to understand how we'd respond to such an event, and you know, getting bottles of water and being able to respond with with tankers and and, and so on. You know, you can you can get tanks manufactured in China within 10 days and shipped over, and you can do all those great things after after a, a major event. But the what we're focusing on is, you know, what do we need to do? Um, in terms of the water supply of resilience to ensure that the, the economy bounces back um, as, as quickly as possible. I must admit, when, when I, when I um, first um, started looking at this, um, this water supply resilience, it, you know, it's, it's quite easy to, to kind of um, feel like you're a rabbit in the headlights. Um, it's, it's, it's quite easy to start jumping to, to solutions and, and start looking at some previous um, work and then joining it all, all together without kind of, you know, taking a proper look at the landscape. Um, so what we decided to do is, is follow that um, strategic um, approach. Um, and our strategic case is available on our, on our website. If you're interested, it's not a big read. It's only about 15 pages long, um, but it really describes what, the, um, what, what we're trying to achieve, what the benefits are, and you know, our political leaders have been able to understand that, and that's allowed us to move on to the next step. The customer level of service, you know, that's a really important um, piece of work. Um, we've been able to um, define what, what that customer level of service um, looks like, and you know, we've made some good progress with our councils there. All five councils have now endorsed that level of service, and we haven't started talking about dollars yet, because um, what, what we're really focusing on is what, what, are, we, you know, what are we aspiring to, um, in, in the next 20 years, 30 years, or even 50 years, if, 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 if it takes that long. But what's important is what are, we, what are we aspiring to in terms of that level of service for water supply resilience? So this is, this is it in a, in a, simple, in a simple diagram. Um, we've, our thinking is evolving, um, but we've, we've defined three phases there. Day zero to day seven is, is our emergency. Um, state, and we are basically um, saying that customers, irrespective of who you are, um, need to have seven days of self-storage. Um, so it's quite a, a big um, change from what, you know from the communication that's that's occurred over the last ten years plus. I've been here for eleven years, and I've I've heard the three-day uh, message, you know, loud and clear. What we're what we're suggesting now is that for, certainly for Wellington, that seven days is probably more appropriate. The survival and stability stage. Um, Increasing availability of, of water to the um, to those critical customers, and we in terms of critical customers, we're thinking about three tiers. Um, tier one would be a, a regional hospital. Tier two, maybe um, schools and 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 and, and that um, and maybe um, old old people's homes. And then um, tier three would be large businesses that require water. And there would be a you know a, a, a varying level of service for for, for those three those three tiers. In terms of um, residents, the survival and stability st um, state, uh, stability state there, and there's an expectation that during that first 30 days, um, beyond that, sorry, be between day eight and day 30, um, there would be a requirement to walk between um, 500 and 1,000 meters um, to get your 20 liters per person per day. So that's the international and recognised best you know, best practice um, level of service that we've that we've um, um, researched from you know from other countries and, and across New Zealand. And then restoration and rapid economic recovery, which is what it's um, all about, um, beyond um, day 30. And the idea is that um, by day 30, 80% um, of the demand, and whatever that demand is, and it will be different, and it will, and it may be in different locations, um, that 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 we'll meet it. So basically, that's what we've communicated to our five councils. That that's what we. Um, believe is is a level of service that's not gold plated, but is but is appropriate for um, for the capital of uh, for the capital of New Zealand. Um, we're about to um, embark on a on a conversation with our with our critical customers. Um, we've been working with Lifelines. Um, there are 42 criti critical sites, and I think 15 to 20 of them require um, some further research to understand what their water needs are. Um, and it's about getting the balance right between storage on site and storage from the network. Um, big dollars to get guaranteed water to the to the doorstep, um, considering the distance from the um, you, you know from the water sources to the customer. Um, but certainly um, a better guarantee if you've got 
um, at 10,000 litres on your doorstep or in your car park under the building or, or whatever. Um, so, we, we, you know, we're going to have a conversation with our customers about, um, without being too definitive about, what, you know, how we could kind of um, re resolve, uh, resolve the water supply, um, looking across personal um, storage and, 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 and the network. And, and then understanding, you know, that total cost um, of investment as well and making sure we've got that, we've got that right. And also, um, there's a huge amount of complexity in, in this work, and we can't guarantee a, 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 you know, everything. Um, so even though we say that you, for, for a regional hospital, um, you, you, know, you, you only need to um, provide seven days of self-storage, there does have to be um, you know, some factor of safety in, in that middle zone there. And um, you know, we're going to be working with those customers to, to ensure that, that between us, we understand what the, um, you know, whether they've got business continuity plans in place and what, and what, and what do they look like and what would be the, what would be the um, water supply requirements for, for that kind of plan. So a regional approach, um, interdependencies. There's um, you know, been a lot of talk um, about in interdependencies and, and, how, and how that's really important to make this whole thing work. And we, we're working very closely, and we've just started working with uh, Wellington Electricity um, and Transpower and Transport Agency and also local roads um, and, and obviously um, ourselves to put a to, to ensure that we've got um, as a business case in place by Christmas for, e for each of those. And um, working with um, the Greater Wellington Regional Council, you know, we, we want to uh, make sure that we've got a, a solid overarching story that ties all that together. Um, if you think about the, you know, electricity and, and the need for um, high levels of interdependency with, with, with us, um, if, uh, it's, it's all very well having um, flash pump stations, but if you don't have um, secure power supplies that, that are able to um, operate those pump stations and that and the grid's not connected back to um, trans power in, in the appropriate way then you know you can see how you can see how things fall over if you don't pay attention to the details so hopefully this 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 work is is a kind of is a, is a strategic piece of work but it's also um, in, intended to go right down to the nuts and bolts of um, of the networks and this is um, just a, um, a final um, slide um, again, probably just reflecting on Norm's conversation about strategy and planning. Um, the top left-hand uh, photograph there is, um, is, is, is our water treatment um, plant in um, Timarua, in Upper Hutt. Uh, you can't see it on that photograph, but about 50 meters offset from, from that structure is where the fault line passes um, past that site. And the, the, that we, you know, we have lots of conversations about, you know, how do you, from an asset management perspective, you know, how do, how do you... How do you make that more resilient? Um, is, is, that the right thing? is that the right thing to do? Do we just want to make things stronger? Or do we want to um, adopt a different type of planning? Do we want to, if you look at the, um, the, the global um, research, and we've, we've been talking to some global leaders around water treatment, there's, there's a big move towards um, modular treatment. Um, so thinking 50 years from now, is, is that the kind of approach? It, does that, is that what a resilient city looks like? You know, a, a plug and play type, type approach to water treatment? Um, where um, you know, you gotta, all you have to do is build a, a concrete slab in an area that's greater than 50 meters away from the fault line, presumably, and, and a series of containers that perhaps you can move around the network and plug into a river and, and, or plug into a, a lake and move around the network. Uh, so these, these, are, these are big challenges for us um, because we, you know, we're locked into this, into this significant infrastructure that we've, that we've invested um, in over the last 50 years. And, uh, you know, disruptive technology and disruptive hazards, it's, um, it's like a perfect storm, really, for strategic, and pl um, strategic planners and, um, and engineers to work together to solve it. And that's, that's the end. Uh, but by the way, um, just before I finish, I was inspired by this photograph. Um, I kind of, um, I thought, isn't that what we're trying to achieve, you know, a, a strong network? And recognizing that there's, um, you know, there's different um, levels of service required um, you know, right across that network. It's not perfect, but it can be uh, repaired quickly. And um, yeah, that's, that would be utopia, wouldn't it? Thank you, Mark. Next up, we have the um, head of Risk and Society from GNS Science, Michelle Daly, and she's gonna be talking us through the economic consequences of infrastructure failure. Thanks, Sarah Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. It's certainly my pleasure and privilege to introduce you to our research program, The Economics of Resilient Infrastructure. 
In fact, I could talk at length on the wealth of knowledge and information we've discovered. It's been a real uh, uh, learning and, and journey. But I hope after just 10 minutes, I've whetted your appetite enough that you can come and find me or, or one of the many team that are here in the breaks to learn more and how we might be able to work with you and, and your teams and your organisations. So I think we've, we've heard already a bit about this today, certainly in the session that I was at um, um, this morning, that infrastructure pressures are, are a major challenge for us in New Zealand. And in this context, I mean lifeline utilities. Well, infrastructure means uh, lifeline utilities such as energy, telecommunications, transport and water. And the costs of new requirements and maintaining existing assets will be a major challenge for the foreseeable future. And I think we see infrastructure as enabling when it works well, but it's very disabling for communities when it doesn't. And what we don't know, we don't know as much about the disabling impacts on our communities as, as perhaps we should do. So we invest quite a bit on the enabling properties of our infrastructure and know a lot less about uh, the disruptive or the disabling um, parts of our infrastructure networks. So New Zealand needs reliable infrastructure to ensure that our government's higher living standards and business growth agenda objectives can be achieved. But as New Zealanders, we do take our infrastructure for granted. And even events such as the Canterbury earthquakes demonstrate our infrastructure's fragility and the suffering that our citizens and communities face when infrastructure services cease and the employment and other losses we, we um, uh, face when bus businesses stop. And poorly performing infrastructure is a constraint on the productivity and puts a real break on New Zealand's economic development. But the community-wide consequences of infrastructure outages are not really very well understood. And the benefits of risk mitigation accrue to the whole community. And we find that our infrastructure organisations find it quite hard to construct business cases based on uh, the community um, benefits of investing in, in infrastructure mitigation, for example. It's very hard to justify good business cases. But all of those community benefits of investing in infrastructure need to be taken into account in those business investment decisions. And also, I would argue, need to be fully recognised in our, in our civil defence emergency management planning. And this is where um, ERI comes in, ERI, Economics of Resilient Infrastructure. What we're trying to do is develop a better understanding of the economic impacts of infrastructure failure in a post-disaster context. It facilitates, we, it will facilitate the improved um, investment decisions by greatly advancing information on what happens when infrastructure outages occur and what can we change to get a different outcome. And it's hard to see how government, utilities, businesses can make good decisions if they don't actually know what's at stake. And infrastructure is central to societal performance. It's a reference again to those enabling characteristics. But its central position also makes it difficult to trace all the myriad impacts, the business impacts, the spatial impact and sequencing impacts of those outages. And it's difficult to do that in a pre-event pre planning stage. And this research program is, is trying to address that gap. So the funding, um, the ERI program has actually brought together four research teams together over a four year period. And we're near at the, at the, nearly at the end of that four year program. It's been a huge effort. And we have over about uh, 22 researchers from a number of different organizations involved in three key research strands. So we're looking at scenarios, so what could happen and then the level of service disruption. So how, will that, how does the infrastructure fail and what does that level of service disruption look like? Then we have a research strand looking at developing an understanding of how businesses adapt to that service disruption. And then we have a team that's developing the economic framework and the model itself. And all of those, those research strands are linked. Putting some faces to the research team. We have some key organisations involved, Market Economics, GNS, Resilient Organisations, and RICS, which is a Dutch-based spatial systems research institute. And harnessing the skills and capabilities of such a large group of people um, from different backgrounds has created quite an innovative and creative space. And I say for the first six months or even longer for the program, we've all had to actually learn to talk each other's language. So we have economists, geologists, um, artificial intelligence experts, spatial experts, uh, business adaptation and behaviours experts, and we've all had to learn uh, each other's language. 
It's creative, a very innovative and, uh, and creative space. So one of the main outputs of the research program is a modeling tool called MERIT. MERIT stands for Modeling the Economic Resilience of Infrastructure Tool. It enables the downstream consequences of infrastructure failure to be quantified. And so it, when we're talking about economic consequences here, I'm, I'm talking about a lot economic losses um, due to just that infrastructure failure. So they don't include any service reinstatement costs or community recovery costs or damage to other infrastructure such as buildings at this stage. There's probably a, a longer term view of where we want the program to go, but just now so to, to take some small bites out of the elephant, we're just concentrating on um, the direct uh, and indirect um, consequences of um, inf infrastructure failure itself. So while the end game is on multiple infrastructure failure after a large event, such as an earthquake, the tool can also look at smaller events, such as single infrastructure outages. And that, for a lot of infrastructure organisations, is, is kind of their business as usual. So it's useful for them to have a model that can actually look at the economic consequences of, of some of those single failure outages. So how does it work conceptually? Well, we start with uh, some outage maps. So that's service level outage maps, and they're developed over a uh, different time horizons. So we have a spatial map of a service level outage over different time horizons, and those time horizons could vary depending on the type of infrastructure. And I'm talking here time horizons such as a day, what does it look like after a day, what might that service level look like after a week, after a month, etc. We then look at, in, those, in that area, how uh, businesses are impacted by that service level over those different time horizons, the degree to which that business is impacted or how operable it is over the time periods that's calculated. And this information is fed into the economic model. And the results are expressed in a number of different ways, including uh, such things as a change in the value added to the economy and how specific sectors are impacted over time. So there's a story there. Um, it's quite a rich story. It's not just about uh, the, the change in the value add at the end of that, that process, but it's about um, how the different economic sectors have responded, what their pathway um, has been to, to particularly um, um, recovery. And we can play around with the mitigation options here. We can play around with the different mitigation, physical mitigation options that the infrastructure networks have uh, that might change their level of service. And we can play around with different business adaptation strategies and see what changes that might have to the outcome. Um, and we can also change different policy levers post-event and see what that, what that might have on a changed outcome or a changed future. So we can generate a number of different futures. Actually, MERIT is not one model, just to confuse the picture a little bit. It's actually a suite of three models. We found when we were developing um, the work that uh, the full spatial, uh, complex spatial version of the model wasn't needed for some of those single outages. Um, and a, um, an inoperable model and a non-spatial model were faster in terms of um, processing time um, and save time, and, and the spatial um, part of the model wasn't needed. And the inoperability and non-spatial versions of model will are soon going to be available uh, as an online tool. But we are working on developing that um, the spatial model, the full merit model, and that's going to be the model that we use for the big scale events, um, the volcanic eruptions or the uh, earthquakes when we're looking at um, um, the interdependencies of, of uh, with interdependencies and a long time scale and horizon as it becomes important. So some of the case studies that we've been, been doing, we've been working on single infrastructure outages, and we have a number of infrastructure partners that we've been walking, working with, been focusing with, um, we're very grateful for their participation and their support, Watercare Services, Vector, Transpower, um, Littleton Port Company, NZTA, and, and recently Wellington Water. So the development, testing, and calibrating of the model has been done with these case studies. Um, and multiple infrastructure failure has been looked at in some of the Alpine Fault and Auckland volcanic eruption scenarios. And we're also starting to work, um, starting to look at a Wellington earthquake scenario as well. It's great to see Erie already influencing and being used by other research programs. So while we are coming to the, to the end of our funded period, we feel we're just starting to get, go, get going. We've got uh, 
quite a lot planned for, for the future. And, but we're also, it's, um, the work's also been picked up by a range of other organisations already and another, a range of other uh, research programmes. And we're really excited about that. They're plugging some of the gaps that were found and extending the scope of work. And finally, some just final comments. Um, I think we are contributing to a more informed discussion about economic impacts. I think that's been a, a gap in our knowledge of risk and the environment that we face. We don't understand economic impacts very well, and nor do we understand social economic um, impacts either. There's a whole other talk on that topic. But our future focus, we are trying to now move more into, rather than just uh, economic sectors, we're starting to look at um, household distribution of impacts um, and more equity issues, infrastructure funding options. So what funding options um, are available for to invest in infrastructure, uh, given an understanding of those different economic features. Looking at rural communities and provincial towns and the struggles that they face with uh, renewing their infrastructure in the face of declining populations and different, different demographics. And, the un and some uncertainty and sensitivity analysis in the models. And also that storytelling. We have a, a very rich amount of information. And I think we've already heard this morning about um, the importance of telling the story creating those scenarios and taking people with us on a journey to understand what those consequences are of different infrastructure failure. Um, and um, yeah, so I think that's really, really where I wanted to leave it. Um, I think the gold is in those stories and I think that's where we're wanting to come to uh, in a future generation of, of the research program. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michelle. Next up, we have Dr. Hugh Cowan, who is the General Manager for the Earthquake Commission. Um, Hugh will be dashing away from the panel after his talk, but if you've got questions, still fire them through the pigeonhole, because we'll make sure that we get them answered for you. Welcome, Hugh. Thank you very much. I'm not going to leave just yet. Yeah, no, thank, thank you. Um, so I work for the Earthquake Commission. Uh, for those of you less familiar with, uh, with our work, we're a crown entity. Um, we... Uh, operate under our own Act of Parliament, the Earthquake Commission Act. Um, our income is derived from a compulsory levy on residential uh, ins fire insurance policies, um, by which the contributions of the many are used to uh, compensate um, the misfortunes of the few. We run a first loss insurance scheme for domestic property in New Zealand, and to that extent, um, supported by a Crown government a government guarantee, uh, we're effectively managing a component of the Crown's balance sheet risk. Um, and in the context of that, uh, we have a focus on uh, risk financing and risk transfer. We lay off about four and a half billion dollars worth of geological risk uh, to the international reinsurance markets every year. Um, and although on an incurred basis, it's fully allocated to the Canterbury losses, um, in 2010, we had a fund, a natural disaster fund, that stood at $6 billion. So we've taken around $11.5 billion worth of cost associated with the Canterbury losses off the Crown balance sheet, or rather um, uh, away from uh, the taxpayer, um, losses that would otherwise have had to be met um, through uh, cuts to social services, taxes, levies, um, or borrowing. Um, in one form or another. So that's the macroeconomic context in which we operate, but we also have a mandate to facilitate research and education, and, in the, and through that, and others have alluded to our research um, investments and our partnerships, uh, we try to inform New Zealand's understanding of uh, geological risk, um, and particularly inform through science and engineering um, an understanding of the pricing of that risk for the purpose of risk transfer um, but more fundamentally, and the focus of my talk today will be enterprise-wide risk management. It's not just about laying off the financial risk. Um, we first need to really understand um, what we are really trying to achieve. And there, just an outline, uh, depending on your particular um, accountability or, the, or the, the role of your organization, are we setting out to save lives? Um, preserve or rebuild buildings and infrastructure? Are we maintaining or restoring economic activity? Are we surviving as a business? Um, and then there may be additionally other, um, other dimensions to, um, to, to value or wealth that, that, uh, that our communities need to consider. And each has different cost and policy 
implications. So it's a judgment call, and the question that I wish to pose today, and I'll return to throughout the talk, is uh, how do we optimize our approach? Um, really, if we think of the, the actor principles, avoid, control, transfer, or accept, <coughs> um, these are the treatment options available to us, and really the challenge is to understand the trade-offs in the treatment options. How do we, how do we understand the worst um, exposures uh, through land use, better land use? How do we mitigate impacts through design and construction practice? Um, indemnifying the worst affected through risk pooling. Um, I mentioned the attributes of the EQC scheme uh, on a large scale, but the principle applies um, really to any community. And then the retention of risk. Um, how much are we willing to take on the chin um, or manage on our way through? And really the, the, uh, the prerequisites for effective optimization, uh, as they are in anything, uh, really involve diverse perspectives. Um, generalize, don't specialize. Um, and, uh, and above all, uh, don't take the cynical short-term uh, focus of simply transferring or channeling the liability to someone else. It generally does not result in optimal risk management. You'll either get it back in the form of a poorly managed uh, outcome or indeed uh, a more costly um, uh, approach um, or cost costly treatment option, um, which, will, which will be anything but transparent. So in terms of the, the objectives themselves, um, let's start with the premise that if you can identify the risk and it's capable of being measured, then provided there is an element of chance in terms of its timing or likelihood, then, uh, then transfer will be available at a price. But be aware that um, gaps in knowledge are generally filled with premiums uh, in the context of insurance, so you really need to have a well-informed approach to what it is you're trying to transfer. And the first question you need to ask is how much uncertainty are you willing to accommodate with regard to a negative outcome? What are your specific priorities? You know, is it service continuity? We've heard others speak of this. Is it managing reputation? Um, are there minimum uh, legal norms uh, of compliance that must be met? Um, and what, are the, what, are the, what is the downside financial risk, which of course lies at the heart of any discussion about risk financing? This handy diagram, which uh, um, David Middleton from Kestrel Group kindly um, gave to me to include in the talk today, um, just illustrates likelihood of occurrence on the uh, vertical axis versus uh, size of loss. And it just illustrates, uh, in, in a simple form, the trade-offs associated with the, um, the very frequent but um, small losses uh, for which, if insurance is available, it will result generally in um, dollar swapping between you paying the premium and the, and the deductible and the insurer collecting it, um, versus what you can potentially transfer um, in terms of controlling volatility around the risk, and you need, to, um, you need to understand what level of volatility you can manage on a monthly or an annual cycle. Uh, and then you get into the realm of the insurable risk um, with the consideration of the impact on, on income, surplus, or, or expenses, um, and understanding, uh, using one of many corporate valuation metrics, what the implications would be if you suddenly had uh, to stretch well beyond your, your expected um, commitments. Uh, out to the right, uh, the rates at which you can transfer um, risk really converge with the cost of capital uh, for anyone providing you with that transfer facility, in which case um, you, you would hope to be able to discount it. But you really need to know uh, where, you, where, you, um, where you might end up. And there are a number of corporate valuation methodologies or metrics that, that are available. Um, these are, are but a few, fairly standard approaches. Um, and when Coming to a decision as to how much you should consider transferring or retaining, you need to consider obviously the, the severity of the risk. You should be thinking about the investment that you already make in mitigation. Uh, what are the mitigation measures already in place? The regulatory environment, uh, what you might be compelled to meet in terms of minimum capital requirements. Um, obviously they are explicit um, uh, if you're an insurer under the prudential um, uh, prudential supervision arrangements. Historical losses and trends provide a social context and economic. Um, what's the marketplace doing? Are you in a soft or a hardening market with respect to risk transfer? And what is your risk appetite or that of your, 
uh, your board or your shareholders or your, your community. What is the total cost associated with transferring your risk? Um, obviously, there's the question of premiums or other hedging arrangements. Um, I've already mentioned the, the existing investment in mitigation, which uh, will span everything from legal compliance through civil defense, health and safety. Um, there may be consulting costs associated with developing a more nuanced understanding of your risk or the trade-offs in treatment, actuarial, loss modeling, analytics. Um, many of these would involve um, specialized expertise. And then you have your internal capability and administration. And last but not least, um, any missed opportunity costs because there are, of course, um, risky or equally risky uh, activities that might be going on in the enterprise that, um, that you're not attempting to, to treat or you're not uh, accounting for um, uh, transparently. Um, methods of risk transfer, we don't have time to really go into these. If you, when, when you reach a point of wanting to uh, consider a particular solution, there are experts uh, out there who specialize in everything from traditional insurance products through alternative risk transfer mechanisms, which include um, uh, risk-linked securities, such as catastrophe bonds, risk swaps that allow uh, parties to diversify their risks, um, provided that they understand the counterparty credit risk and also the, the, um, the characteristics of the risk in terms of expected loss or maximum loss relative to a constant return period. Um, Obviously, there are challenges associated with managing the politics around risk swaps if you're trading a European storm for a central US earthquake um, and how those, um, how those liabilities would be adjusted and, and, um, and run off. Um, contingent capital is really just a pre-loss funding arrangement. You pay a, a, um, a, a capital uh, provision um, fee, which is generally non-refundable, and that will secure access to debt or equity at a, at a predetermined price in the event of an adverse um, occurrence. At the bottom line, um, you have to consider when would, when would you like to pay? If you look at well-being uh, versus spending on safety, um, clearly there is some level of investment um, short of which the post-event cost will be too great. But if you spend too much on, on safety in whatever form, the pre-event cost will be too great. You will be incurring opportunity costs uh, and subtracting capital from other needs. Um, so you have to ask yourself, what really is sustainable? And I'll finish by saying, um, in all of this, you must understand the difference between getting it roughly right or precisely wrong. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Hugh. Um, last but not least, we have Dr. Paul Barnes, uh, who is with us from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, to talk about developing a national resilience strategy. I've been told I can have the full 10 minutes, so that might go into your uh, escape time, but please bear with me. I may finish faster, I may take the full period of time. A little bit about ASPE. If you could imagine the Brookings Institution mixed with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, that's sort of like what ASPE is. ASPE uh, has been set up about 14 years ago in Canberra, uh, initially by the Defense Department in Australia to provide contestable policy advice about a whole range of things related to national security, but also capability to do with defense uh, issues and capacity. Uh, in recent times, it uh, has invested in a new approach, uh, one of, a couple of different areas, one of which is the program that I uh, have great uh, pleasure in running, Risk and Resilience. Uh, originally, it was to be purely disaster resilience, but uh, the wisdom of our executive director decided to expand my uh, area of uh, influence without any more money into resilience as a organizational context, as a infrastructure related context, as a national phenomenon. So what I'd like to talk about in the uh, eight minutes and 45 seconds I have left based on the clock is some of the challenges that uh, I think Australia is facing. Uh, they may be similar to the challenges uh, New Zealand is facing and has worked with and will be working on, but in terms of looking at a national resilient strategy as compared to a disaster resilient strategy or a, a national uh, uh, all hazards type uh, or natural hazards resilient strategy. 
One of the first things that you would all agree with, I think, is that the challenges of acquiring resilience either at a national level, at an institutional level, at an infrastructure system level is that there are complexity issues, there's massive amounts of uncertainty, and there's a degree of ambiguity. Now, this is not going from highest to lowest, this is just the complexity of dealing with the concept of resilience, because if we don't understand what we mean by resilience and how it's going to be applied to various sectors and applications, we may be what many of our elected officials in Australia, as compared to the elected officials in New Zealand, uh, talk fest. And again, we have the challenges, as you heard this morning, that we may have another Prime Minister in Australia on July the 2nd. Um, so we have to start the policy dialogue process over again. But some context. Over the years, end of the year 2010 and into 2011, the state of Queensland, where I originally came from, was impacted by at least four tropical cyclones in four months, and a range of other resultant flooding events impacting infrastructure systems both deemed critical and discovered to be critical as a result of the cascading effects of the events. Now, a little bit busy there on the screen, but 85% of the state of Queensland was disaster declared. Now, if you can appreciate how much of the country Queensland takes up in Australia, a very large amount of uh, the uh, area space, 85% of, of that geographical spread disaster declared is a significant uh, a significant uh, decision by Canberra in, in result of, uh, in reaction, I should say, to a very complex event. Three years after the declaration of the disaster, the organisation created to manage the infrastructure rebuild finished its first tranche of work and was renewed as an ongoing entity within the Queensland Government. The Queensland Reconstruction Authority embodied as a statutory authority to coordinate all future disaster response in terms of build back within that state. So the complexity that Australia is facing in Queensland, it's not only bushfires, but also floods, cyclonic events. In Victoria and other parts of the country, we have predominantly other types of hazards that manifest. Bushfires in uh, Victoria, etc., are critical things that have been driving the policy processes and the changes in that state. We also have this notion in Australia of the infrastructure plan. Where do we need to invest in terms of economic sustainability, growth, etc., infrastructure being one of those key areas. Now, there was a Northern Australia audit. If you look at the Tropic of Capricorn North, Western Australia, Northern Territory and Queensland, where are the critical elements of infrastructure that need to be invested in and preserved? There was a lovely 120-page report, the North Australian audit. If you Google, sorry, if you searched for resilience, continuity, disaster resilience in that document, you would be surprised to find that it didn't appear anywhere in it. And you may appreciate that there are certain strategic policy institutes who put their hand up and say, please, sir, there's no mention of these critical issues in your report. The final infrastructure plan had two pages out of 200 on resilience and critical infrastructure resilience issues. So there is a recognition in Australia, on one hand, we need to invest in infrastructure and we plan for that and there's a growing awareness in a range of non-conventional uh, departments and institutions that the notion of preparing resilient thinking along with investment planning is a critical element that the country needs. Now, as mentioned uh, earlier, we do have a national strategy for disaster resilience. We also have a critical infrastructure resilience strategy and policy. I think we need to go further, and in fact, if you talk to certain elements and certain people within uh, senior departments within uh, Australia as a federal system, you may find after a few beers, and I'm sure New Zealanders don't drink beer to discuss business or wine, they may say these things have worked very well up to this point, but as Richard Thornton mentioned this morning, the, the uh, strategy for disaster resilience is being redesigned, rethought, re-evaluated as is the critical infrastructure resilience strategy. Government officials may, in their druthers, tell you that there is a need for a national resilience strategy that looks from an all hazards context. Now that is all hazards. It's not just combining natural hazards with certain types of technical events that could occur. All hazards, I'll come back to that just as I finish. But as you'd appreciate, infrastructure systems are impacted because they are interdependent. 
dependency and interdependencies are critical. The top right hand corner, or left hand corner, I'm sorry, of this slide, a natural phenomena quickly impacts technical issues. Waste treatment plants, water treatment plants are impacted. Social impacts, anybody here who has a 14 year old offspring who cannot recharge their iPad if the electricity is gone, has a social impact in their household. And if our waste treatment plants are offline or if potable water supplies are impacted, we very quickly have biological impacts. So one of the other driving factors for me and my thinking about a national resilient strategy in Australia is that natural may be the initial trigger, but it quickly becomes technical, biological, social, etc. Complex crises require very high level thinking that pans down into lower level operating areas. Now this is busy, but the question here is that what is resilience? Do we really understand what we mean by resilience? The Australian Productivity Commission said that we need to invest in planning and preparation, not just response and recovery. And the report that that particular institution put together is still sitting on a, an elected official's desk. Nothing has been done about the recommendations about two, maybe almost two and a half years ago. But they talk about resilience in a particular way that is different to the Sendai framework, very different again to the US Department of Homeland Security. Now I'm only using three examples of different definitions and applications. If we go back to looking at what words mean when it comes to policy development, legislative development and application, unless we have clarity of understanding of what we mean by resilience, we may have a multitude of end results all of which might not be as useful as they could be if we had that coherence. So the question again, national strategies require coherence and clarity of terminology. One of Australia's research centres based at Adelaide University talk about resilience, resilient communities, that they're able to function, sustain critical systems uh, even under stress, they can adapt to changes, they're self-reliant, and they learn from experience. For me though, that's talking about what a resilient community can do and needs to be able to do, not necessarily what a resilient community is. So I think that there are underlying principles that we need to consider about resilience in a community level. Now, this, Im uh, this image I stole from the UN, it was based on 30 year research. Those of you who have been working in this space for many years may recall the Brundtland Report uh, that was the basis of healthy cities work coming out of the UN, I think 28 and a half years ago. This image is derived from that particular work. And I think it's reasonable to step back and say, what are the principles of a resilient community? We have built an ambient environments that are viable, communities that are convivial, they work together, they know each other, and local economies that are vibrant as well. And again, the balance of a working community may have all of these in operation. If we are disturbed by disasters, and we're getting to the end of my 10 minutes, I'm only halfway through. If, don't hook me off the stage, please. I think we need to go back to understand the principles of community resilience before we try to measure resilient activity at community level. If we do that, we might then be able to say, what's a resilient state look like? What does a resilient nation look like? So the petaled image going from the local level to a state level to a federal level. One of the blessings of Australia as compared to New Zealand, possibly not a blessing, is that we have a federal government and state governments and local governments. The Australian uh, constitution does not allow the federal government to interfere in a whole range of areas other than defence, national defence. The state governments are where the rubber hits the road and at some times there's a disagreeable tension between local government and state governments. So there is a need, I think, to align attributes of resilient functioning along then with measures of resilient functioning that can operate at a federal sphere, state sphere, and to the local and community levels. A national strategy hopefully would align those. One of the elements that uh, also supports the notion that a national resilient strategy is useful is that Two of the states of Australia, Queensland and Victoria, have created roles called Inspector Generals of Emergency Management. Those particular roles put their hand on their heart and their head and say to the elected minister of the state, the state is as 
ready in a prevention, response and recovery mode for any disaster that might occur. From local accident to emergency, escalating to a large wide area disaster. So those states have a means by which they can actually convey a lack of readiness or confirm readiness to the elected officials. They're completely independent of response agencies and other allied agencies that are involved in response. So another reason to have the Director General EMA in Australia, based in Canberra, working in a particularly acceptable way with Inspector Generals or people in various states that have that role. So joined up governance. But again, resilience could be, if you're looking naturally, a rainforest stays a rainforest, it's resilient, it doesn't change. Climate variability, lack of rainfall, it turns into some other form of a forest, wet sclerophyll or other type. It changes from one state to another steady state. Is that what we mean when we use the term resilience? Or do we have a created hybrid form where we both talk about continuity of services and function at a community level that then is, it, uh, is affected and then recovers? We need to have clarity, I think. Again, a national strategy may give that. Because if we really are working on all hazards, all agencies, we need to go from threat specific to an all hazards, where we're looking at scenarios, futures thinking is critical, tasks and capabilities needed for future response, but also tasks and capabilities for prevention, the ability to make communities and systems resilient to change and disturbance. Whole of institution, region, state and nation. Australia's, as I said, easy because we can see the gaps and the challenge is joining the gaps. Systemic impact assessment, where are we vulnerable in terms of institutions, infrastructure systems, communities? How do we have national continuity planning? And I, again, the other side of the coin from a resilient strategy is a national continuity plan. How do we bring back functionality of a whole economy? We have to do it from the communities, the regions, the states, and then to the federal levels. Proactive, we have to anticipate where we will be impacted. We have to anticipate the collaboration that we need to have ahead of actually going into action. And flexibility and agility, we have to be able to imagine what we need to do. So the challenges that my, uh, my program at ASPE is uh, embarking on is, is, you know, it's gonna be easy, as you would agree, I think, to talk federally, state, locally. But there is a very strong support from the emergency response agencies and the other support agencies, volunteer agencies around the country. And um, it would be very, it will be very interesting to uh, experience the process that I'm trying to stimulate. But certainly the challenges are there. And I think uh, we can only benefit and certainly if we, any learnings we can have, we can pass across the water to New Zealand and certainly the other direction because there's a lot to learn for us here. Thank you.